Um, this is a great church, and this is a great town. We have only been in church maybe twice in all those 10 years, and uh, we normally go back on Sunday to be a part of our own church. But this place is like gorgeous. This place is like beautiful. I have about 25,000 pictures on my Mac, and I probably have about 24,000 of Paul's ball. I mean, you know, not quite. But I have pictures of boats. I've gone out and taken all these amazing things in the bay. I've taken, this is the truth, I'm kind of ashamed of it, I've taken pictures of Sly's Bakery. <laughs> I have, I mean, I have. I have, and I've even preached sermons on Sly's Bakery. <laughs> About three, to be actually, to tell you the truth. And, uh, you know, just a month ago when we heard that uh, I was in my prayer room, not trying to sound real spiritual, but I try to start the morning with prayer, and I was praying, and Chad calls, and he says, Dad, Cynthia's water is just broke. And right then, I did not know what to do. But four hours later, I was on a plane, praise God, and I was here to see my first grandson born. My first grandson. <laughs> screensaver. Yeah, screensaver. I can't help it. He's the most beautiful boy I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, we also honor you. Tom, I want you to stand. Yesterday, it was his 52nd birthday. Stand, stand, come on. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Tom. Happy birthday to you. Come on, let's hear it. And uh, actually, the only lie I have told today is his age, but... 42. I am interested this morning in not impressing you, and God knows my heart. You know, I actually came with 1,400 sermons, but I'm going to preach today a sermon that's probably not even in the top, that I, if I've got a top, but I really believe it's the message that you need to hear. How many of you believe in God speaking to a preacher? How many of you believe that? Five people. How many of you believe that? I prayed and prayed and prayed about what I was preached to preach to you, and I know that I'm doing what God wants. I'm not here to impress you. I'm here to do what the Lord wants. Let's stand together to honor God's word. Turn to Joshua, the first chapter, verse one. I want to preach a message that I preached earlier called expectation. Everybody scream out, expectation. expectation. Now, come on, I'm from Oklahoma, and I expect people to cooperate. Come on. Say Expectation. Joshua 1.1, 1, 1. after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all the people, get ready. Everybody said, get ready. Get ready. Say it again, get ready. get ready. Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Now hold up your uh, smart device, if you will, or your Bible, and put your other hand on it right now. Father, I ask right now that you will take this word that's anointed. It's already anointed. It's quicker and sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray, God, that it will come out of this anointed word into lives made anointed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that lives will be changed distinctly. They don't need to hear from a man. They need to hear from God. And I pray, God, that this word will communicate to them. I pray it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to talk about expectation. And a big question that I want to ask you this morning is, what are you expecting? Come on, what are you expecting? What are you expecting for 2016? I don't know about the year that you've had in 2015, but it's been a great year for the Rose family. It's probably been a great year for you. But I don't want to rest on past years. I don't want to rest on what God's done in the past. In fact, the Bible says we're not to do that. We're to look forward to great things. So I believe that this is the day that the Lord has made. How many of you believe that? We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I believe with all of my heart 
that it was a good thing when we came to church this morning. Let us be glad to come into the house of the Lord. And I believe that God wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we can even ask or imagine or even think. I believe that with all of my heart. So I've got to ask you a question. What are you expecting? It wasn't long ago that I was suffering from a kidney stone. Now, I've had several kidney stones. It's like having a baby about that size. I've had several babies and have lived to talk about it. And I was experiencing pain, and I don't normally share that I was experiencing pain. But I, it was kind of like the end of a service, and I said, man, I'm really hurting. And I really need somebody to pray for me. And I went down to the altar, and different ones were praying. But this lady by the name of Cindy... Cindy Crosby. She walked up to me. She said, Pastor, you don't have to hurt. She laid her hand on the back of my back. I did not know how she knew it, but she laid her hand exactly where I was having the pain. She began to pray in the name of Jesus. And friends, moments later, there was no pain, no stone. Praise God. There was no delivery of a stone. Anyway, God had touched my life. And the deal is, if you know Cindy and Brian, They're parts of our church. We call our church M1A. They believe God can do anything. And so she just could not take the answer no. She said, we're going to deal with this right now. What are you expecting are the words. And I want to talk about this in three different ways. Now, first of all, this thing about expecting things, it's like a child getting ready to go to Disney World the day before Disney World. Or it's like a bride Before the wedding day, oh my heavens, the feelings that are there are like a man before he starts his first job and he knows that this job is just made for him. He's expecting something. And I believe with all of my heart that you need to just be expecting God to do something great. So I want to talk about this three ways. I want to talk about how the word seeds my expectation. Everybody say the word seed. Let's try it again. Seed. Seed. S-E-E-D. Say it. Seed. Now, to use this form of the word seed, in the dictionary, it is to place something into something that will produce greater something. Let's talk about that again. It is to place something into something to produce greater something. And God wants us to produce amazing things this year. But he wants us to play seed that will produce increase. So I want to talk about how the word seeds my expectations, how my expectations seeds my action, and how my action seeds my miracle. First of all, the word seeds my expectation. Now take your Bible out. We're going to use the Bible a lot today. Joshua 1.1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, He said to Joshua, now that's very significant. If you will read in the Bible, so far God has used Moses. My heavens, all kinds of great miracles. They have been brought right to the brink of the promised land. And who was chosen? Joshua was chosen to be Moses' assistant. You will read that when it came to going up on the mountain, it would be Joshua that would go up on the mountain. When when Moses had the glory of God all over him, well, it would be Joshua that would see the glory of the Lord. And as you begin to look at the life of Joshua, he was handpicked to go in to a new dimension. I believe with all of my heart that the greatest days for Gateway are still ahead. Come on. I believe with all of my heart that there's a spirit of expectation for 2016. I mentioned it in the first service that we are getting ready at M1A to go into our week of prayer. And through that week, we take in tablets and we take in pencils and we pray. The staff prays all morning and then we come together at night. But the church comes all through the week and they pray all through the week. And we believe with all of our heart that we have to start with first things first. And you're getting ready to do this in this amazing series that the pastor is delivering about boot camp. Is that right? Or uh, base camp. And in base camp, there are things that are the basics. How many of you believe in prayer? Would you raise your hand right now? Come on, come on. How many of you believe that when we pray, God acts? Come on. Can you say amen? 
But I also believe that there's power in the Word. So in our church, we will kind of center ourselves to pray through the Bible in a year. How many of you think that's a good thing? Come on. Yeah, five people. How many of you? Six people, seven people. How many of you think reading the Bible is a good thing? Come on. So we will do that, and we'll get Bible apps out, and we'll show different ways that you can read the Bible, but we can't go wrong when we get in God's Word. Come on. We can't go wrong. In fact, God will speak to us. And so here's what's happening. Joshua is getting a word from the Lord here. All the words from the Lord have gotten into Moses, but now he gets a word for himself. And as this happened, it's a word of hope. In verse 3, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I have promised Moses. Look at this. I will. I will give you. I will give you territory. In other words, he says in verse 4, I will spell out all of the things that I am going to give you. Now look at verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. And then this phrase is said over and over in the first chapter, be strong and courageous. You will lead these people to inherit the land. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law. And it goes on to say, do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Now let's go back to what I was saying. I believe that there is power in the word of God. Come on. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Say it. Come on. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I know what that means. I know they would come and they would gather the church and they would take the book of Paul and they would read it. Faith came by hearing. But I want to tell you that Word is powerful. Come on. And he gets this word and he says, meditate on this word. Do not let this word get away from your mouth. Do not let, just speak this word. And then it says these words, then, look at verse 8 at the end of it, then you will be prosperous and you will be successful. Now let's stop for a moment. How many of you believe it's God's will for you to be successful? Oh yeah. Now here's the big one. How many of you believe it's God's will that you prosper? I believe it. I believe with all of my heart that if we do what God says, that we will begin to move and advance in God's prosperity. Now, I believe that with all of my heart. Joshua, what was happening was the word was seeding expectation. Come on, let's get this. The word was seeding, throwing seed upon him to where he began to expect things from the Lord. The word seeds my expectation. Say that back to me. Come on. Come on. Just pretend you're from Oklahoma and scream it out to me. Here we go. Go. How many of you believe what you just spoke with your mouth right there? Come on. The word, as I get the word in me, begins to seed my expectation. It's like a pregnant lady getting ready to, she has a sonogram, and the doctor says, it's a boy. Do you want to see? And suddenly she looks at the sonogram and she goes excited. And, but, but the baby's not born yet. She has the word that something good is coming. And as the word is something good is coming, that every month is excited. Every month that they move to the, the baby being born is amazing. It's like ordering something on Amazon. You know, I like Amazon. Does anybody like Amazon? My wife is addicted to Amazon. Would you pray for me, please? <laughs> But we will order something from Amazon, and then we get that email that comes and says, your order has been placed, and you will receive it, and then she gets excited. Oh, honey, we're going to get it. It's like that. The word comes, but four, two days later, because we belong to Prime, suddenly it's delivered on our door. You see, the word comes, and the word, are you all getting this? It seeds, it seeds my expectation. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that you have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Hebrews 1, 1 says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for, that's expectation, will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about things we cannot see. 
In Acts, the first chapter, you read about Jesus is getting ready to ascend. And he says, but wait, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. What is he doing here? He is seeding their expectations. If that had not had happened, then they would have not gone to the upper room and prayed for 10 days before the day of Pentecost had arrived. What happened were the word, the words of Jesus had seeded their expectations. You get to Acts 3, the same thing happens. uh, Peter and John go to uh, the temple to the hour of prayer and they see a man lying there beside gate beautiful and they look at this guy this guy looks at Peter and John expecting to receive something why because they they they've given him attention silver and gold have I none but such as I have give I you there was a spirit of expectation and there's not any way to get away from it right now It's amazing that if you begin to let God seed that into your heart, something will begin to happen. One pastor was in a hospital, and he was visiting the quarters, and as he was coming through a semi-dark hallway, instantly a man jumped out from the hallway, and he didn't know this man, but he just began to scream, my wife, the doctor says she's going to live. It's a miracle. She's going to live. She's going to live. And as, as, as the pastor was walking down the corridor, that word of hope began to get into him. And suddenly he thought, that's what I needed to receive. And I, I want to tell you today, I know this because I'm not just here preaching a sermon. I have prayed a lot before I've come up here. And there are some of you, you're here today and you need a miracle desperately. You've come out of the holidays and maybe you've had a, you have a blended family. And going to this house and going to this house and trying to make all the family happy has not been the most joyous occasion for you. And you're here right now and you're saying, man, I just want to get the holidays over. I am here to tell you that God has sent me here to tell you that there's a new day coming. Hallelujah. And you need to believe it. And you need to feel that it's coming. And you need to have hope. And you need to have faith like you have not had in a long time. How many of you believe? that this morning come on come on let's give the Lord a clap offering I've just read the good news you're gonna make it okay so the word seeds my expectation secondly my expectation seeds my action now this makes sense I get the word and I get excited but just to get excited is not enough I have to move into action Now, Moses faced the Red Sea. Joshua is going to face the Jordan. Joshua just does not hear the word of the Lord, but he acts on the word of the Lord. And if I had time to teach you through all of this, it's amazing the action steps that he takes. But among two of the action steps I want to talk about. First action step is he orders his officers to get the supplies ready. Now, Verse 10 says, so he ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp, tell the people, get your supplies ready. Now, what supplies? (laughs) They have been eating manna from heaven. What supplies? And now they begin to scourge the land and begin to get supplies to go in to the land. That's the first thing he does of action. He commands the officers and the officers move into action and the people move into action the second action step is he sends the spies the second time into Jericho now remember 38 years ago he has seen the promised land Moses is not going to get to go but he and Caleb have been held over for something great and now he's going to get to go and see what he has seen 38 years prior to this moment But he sends the the, uh, spies in. This time they come back with a positive report. And in this report, they talk about Rahab the harlot. They said, you know what? We went and we hid on her roof. And as we hid on her roof, you know what happened? The king's officers came. She lied to them, sent them out another way. And you know what happened next? 
She comes down and she says words to us that we receive. She says, everybody has been hearing what God is doing. And we know that you're going to take over the land. And we know beyond any word that, that, that you're, going to be, you're going to be the dominant force here. What is she doing here? She has her expectation seated. And then her, her, this, this expectation is backed up by action. She says, now when you come in, save us. And you have this most beautiful picture of this scarlet cord that is held outside. And the the, the spies escape. But later on, when they come in to take over the land, the scarlet cord saves them. And we all know what that symbolizes. How many of you are thankful that Jesus has come for us? Come on. That Jesus died on the cross for us. That he rose on the third day. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And I'm here to tell you that Hebrews 13, 8 is true. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And get this gateway. Your greatest days are not behind. Your greatest days are ahead. Hallelujah. And this town knows this. And the enemy knows this. You are headed for the greatest day of this church. I believe it with all of my heart. You say, how is this going to happen? The Word. The Word seeds my expectation. And my expectation seeds my action. I start moving by what the Word says that I need to do. And of course, later, what's so amazing about this is they will later go into the promised land as they walk through the first steps of the Jordan River. It's absolutely amazing. James 2 verse 18 says, show me your faith without your deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. Luke 8 verse 42 talks about how Jesus was on his way and as he was on his way, crowds began to press around him. And as the crowds began to press around him, there was a lady who had heard the word, Jesus is here. Jesus is the miracle worker. But if she had done nothing, she would have never had her miracle. You see, the word seeds her expectation, and her expectation seeds her action. And so she begins to move, and as she begins to move, she gets on her knees, and she crawls through the crowds of the people, and she makes her way to the hem of Jesus' garment. And as she grabs the hem of his garment, instantly she feels the virtue of Jesus flow through her body. And Jesus, knowing that power has gone out from him, says, somebody has touched me. Are you going to be that person who touches Jesus? You can't do it by just saying, amen, God wants great things for Gateway. No. It's time for this amazing church to be called together as an army under the direction of your pastor and begin to move out for the greatest days that it's ever had. I know what a great year you have had. I know, because that's all my son has talked about. I'm getting a little tired of it. I know that. But I believe greater things are ahead. Somebody say, man, come on. Greater things are ahead. And you know what the greater things are? Okay, everybody tune in. It's for that alcoholic to get saved that somebody has been praying for for a long time. Come on. It's about that sister over here that you've been praying for for years. You say, I can't do it. I've talked to them all I can talk to them. But I'm here to tell you that God can do it. God can do it. And this is the year that you need to start praying like you have never prayed for before. Because last I found out this, listen to me, we don't do it anyway. The Holy Spirit does it through the power of the Lord. So we've got to believe God for great things. Come on. This will be the year that if you'll believe God, you'll see people walk into this church. And you'll, it happened to me, Pastor, three weeks ago. Debbie and I actually, the week before that, said, where is, and she, I don't want to call this name out because probably people are listening to me preach in Oklahoma. But I said, where is so-and-so? I said, I don't know. I've been worried about him. And the long story of it was it, alcohol had just taken over his family, totally taken over his family. And he was drunk most of the time, and his wife left him, and they divorced. And you know what? The next Sunday I was in church, and I turned around, and there he was seated two rows behind me as I was preparing to come up on the platform. I said, what are you doing? He said, God saved me. I've been in Teen Challenge. I'm clean. I'm clean. I'm clean. The Lord has delivered me. I'm clean. Now stop for a moment. This isn't in the sermon notes. How many of you believe the Lord can do anything? Come on. He can. 
the word the word let's get the word in us the word's going to get me excited it's going to seed my expectations and my expectations is going to seed my miracle i told this old story this morning and believe it or not it was the comments that i was getting after the message i thought everybody would heard this story it's about the old scotsman that had this boat and the oars in the boat and he would ferry people across to the other side in a simple little rowboat and uh, one day somebody was going down to get in the rowboat and they looked and etched onto one oar was the word faith and etched onto another oar was the word works they said what does that mean he said i will illustrate he got out in the boat he took one oar and he began to go after it the oar of faith and all did, all the boat did was go in circles he said this is what happens when you just have faith he said, now, let me put the faith oar down. Let's take the works. He started going with that one. The, the boat went in circles, this time the opposite way. He said, this is what happens. You still go in circles when it's just works. But let me take both oars now. And he began to pull with both of these oars. And he says, this is the way you get to the other side, is when faith is backed up with works. Listen to me. God's trying to speak. What's time now is not to just say great things are going to happen, but we've got to get involved. We've got to do something. Again, I don't know you other than great things that I've heard about you, but this is your year to get involved with Gateway if you're not. This is your year to come up to Pastor Tom or one of the staff and say, I want to get involved. I want to start a small group, or I want to do this, or I want to do that, and let these guys lead you. But it's not time to be a spectator. It's a time to move into action that this city would find Jesus Christ. If you believe that, say amen. My last point. Let's, let's go over it because I'm a preacher teacher. I don't want you to forget it. The word seeds my what? Expectations. You're a good listener. Expectation seeds my action. And the last point is action seeds my miracle. Now, you'd expect me to talk about miracles because I'm from Tulsa. <laughs> Just 40 miles away. But I, last I read, miracles are in the Bible. Come on. And there's somebody here today that badly needs a miracle. You've walked into here and your health is bad. And you've walked into here and something else. I don't know if I've mentioned it in this service or the last, but every time I have prayer request time, we bring people to the front. It's a little different in Oklahoma. We pray for them, you know, and we lay hands on them. But to be honest with you, if we prayed for everybody that had a need, the whole congregation would have to come down here. Because I've got a need, you've got a need. There's not anybody here that does not have a need. And the truth of it is, we have a God, last I heard, that wants to meet our needs. Come on. He's a miracle worker. But it starts with the word. The word. I've got to throw seed on that word. And I've got to begin to expect things that I've never expected God to do. And then my expectation has got to make me move into action. Just like Cindy said, Pastor, I'm going to lay hands on your back and you're going to be healed. And I was healed. That action then produces the miracle. And as I close this sermon, what happened is they, in chapter 3, they begin to act. They acted, first of all, with the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, the glory of God. It was carried by the priest. And you know what? When the priest touched the water, the second they touched the water, the water began to part. Now this is symbolic. Leadership leads the way. As leadership leads the way, then God honors what leadership goes. And you know what? This was a great miracle because as the water began to part, there were two million people that are crossing the Jordan at flood stage. Think about that for a moment. It's a further miracle that the water would, 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 would go this way and that way, but suddenly there's dry ground. That's another miracle. And it's another miracle that all these two million people are going to cross. It must have taken a day for that to happen. But you know what? They crossed in one of the greatest miracles in the Bible as they went to a new dimension, to a new place that God was going to use. And as they did this, as the priest carried the Ark of the Covenant, which means God always goes first, and stood on firm ground in the middle of the Jordan, all of Israel passed. I believe with all of my heart that my action seeds my miracle. 
and I'm going to ask you again, what are you expecting? Come on. Let's go back to the initial question that I started out with. What are you expecting this year? I don't want to hear about politics. In fact, I'm tired of hearing about politics. Somebody say amen. Amen. I don't really care who you're going to vote for. What I do care about is where Jesus is in your life. Come on. That wasn't as big an amen. I think we need to forget politics for a while and center on Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. What we need to do is stop listening to all of the news reports. And trust me, I know what's going on in the world. I listen every day. But instead of listening to constantly CNN, constantly negative news, what I need to listen to is the, the news that Jesus has come. Hallelujah. And that Jesus is alive. And Jesus wants to do something. Come on. If not, I will live depressed. I'm not living depressed. I'm going to live in faith, and I'm going to live with hope. And as I do this, and as I begin to move out in faith, and begin to move out in in hope, then God's going to answer my prayer. What are you expecting? In 1924, Watchman Nee was just 21 years old. He had contracted TB, and in that, doctors expected him to die. In fact, they looked to him and said, you're going to die. And so he went and he wrote, he wrote a lot of amazing things. But if you've ever read his book called The Spiritual Man, it's an amazing book. And when he finished it, he said, okay, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. And when he said those words, God spoke back to him three words. The first word was, the just shall live by faith. Okay, God, that sounds good. The second word was, by faith you stand. That sounds good too, God. But the third word was, we walk by faith. Now that's totally different. So since he got that third word, he decided, well, I'm not going to live sick anymore. He got up from his sick bed. He walked to where a new group of Christians were meeting. And instead of dying, he preached a three-hour sermon that Sunday in front of those people. Why? Because the word seeded his expectations. His expectations seeded his actions, and his actions seeded a miracle. I close with this story only because I'm here, and only because my son is here. And we shared this in the first service. I know Chad has told various forms of this, but I have the right story. I want to tell you that right now, because we've seen it from a parent's perspective. When I was uh, in the 80s, I traveled for the Kansas district. I was nine years, I was the district youth director. That meant that I was elected by, back in those days, you were elected by the body. And uh, that was a surprise to me that they wanted me to do that. And I would preach at a different church every weekend, every weekend, a different church. And then there was an office in Wichita, and I would run camps for kids and all kinds of things that we would do for youth, raise missions money, and that's what we would do. Chad was three years old, and we were in Dodge City, Kansas. I had preached in Dodge City, Kansas many times, and we're going back in the car, and he's screaming in the car, Dad, my leg hurts. My leg hurts. Dad, my leg hurts. We thought that he had just played with the boys and just done something crazy, and we really didn't think it was much. By the way, prior to that time, we had been at Disneyland or somewhere, and he complained about his leg, but we didn't think a lot about that either. We thought they would get over it. But the next day, or shortly after that Sunday, we went, I think there was a holiday, I think we actually went on on Tuesday, and as we went in to the doctor's office, Dr. Robinson, he took an x-ray of Chad's hips, and when he got done, he said, I want you to leave Chad right here, I do not want him to walk but I want you to go into this next room. We've all seen the light tables, not the table, the thing on the wall where the doctor clips the x-rays on. And uh, I'm a doctor, but I'm not a medical doctor. And at this point, I didn't have to be. Anybody here could have seen those x-rays and seen those bones and seen the hip, seen where these bones are going, and I can still see it, where the ball of the hip was supposed to be in Uh, the socket there, there was nothing but pieces of fragmented bones. And when you looked at the next leg, it was exactly the same way. And when we saw that, Pastor Tom, honestly, I didn't know how he'd made it. I didn't know how he'd walk. I did not know how he'd walked. 
And at that point, the doctor looked at us and he said, he's either got cancer or he's got Lake Perthes disease. Now, I wasn't prepared for either one of those. Cancer or Lake Perthes disease. I'm a crier by nature. I cry at every movie that ends where old Yeller gets killed. And, you know, I, I just cry all the time. And, but I just start bawling. I just start bawling. My son has either got cancer or Lake Perthes disease. I scooped him up. We put him in the car. He was asleep. That's how much he's worried about it. We drove back. It took us about 25 minutes to get to our house. Debbie and I are bawling all the way as we packed the clothes to go to the hospital. And we went to the hospital and we stayed there eight days. I don't know why it took so long, but they ran all kinds of x-rays on him. They tested him every way they could for cancer. And finally they looked at us and they said, he does not have cancer, but he's got leg Perthes disease. Now we'd never heard that word. We did not know what that meant. And back in that day, what it meant was that they would put a kid, they used to put him in cast, but they would put him in uh, leg braces and I don't know if you've ever seen this where you're it's like hiking a football and he the only problem was here he is a little three-year-old trying to navigate that way and we're preaching every Sunday in another church and I'm just going to admit to you I, with all the sincerity and honesty that I, I had no faith no faith I would preach on faith but here would come my kid like a cripple I remember looking across the street one day, Tom, at where we lived in Andover, and I looked across the street, and the kids were making fun at him, the way he walked. And I'm going to tell you, I about lost it. I wanted to go over there and whip every one of those kids. That was my boy they were laughing at. I couldn't believe they were making fun of him. But I didn't do anything. I just held it inside. One month went by. We went to the specialist. He took the x-rays. Nothing had changed. The second month we went, nothing had changed. About the third week, second week, after the second month, there was a missionary. I believe in missions more than anything. And he was in, right on the border of Bangladesh and India. His name is Brother McCabe. Brother McCabe got in front of the school. And it was a Bangladesh school. And he said, there's a little white-faced boy by the name of Chad Rose back in Oklahoma. And he's got a disease. And his parents are very upset. The whole district is very upset over him. We're going to pray for him. And so the, these, these people who'd never seen us began to pray for us. And when they got done, the Indian principal, she was a lady, she got a burden for Chad, and she prayed all night, all night. She got, got up from her prayer at the beginning of the morning. She went into Brother McCabe, and she said, Missionary McCabe, that boy is healed in the name of Jesus. They wrote this amazing letter. They sent it back. We still have the letter. And as she, they unfolded the letter there in the district office, and I read it. I wish I could tell you. Honestly, I wish I could tell you. I got so excited. Oh, my boy is healed. But I know where some of you are right now. Some of you have been prayed for a hundred times, and you haven't received your miracle yet. And I sat there, and I go, isn't that nice that somebody would love us this much that they would do this? But I had no faith at all. Two weeks went by. We went to our annual, monthly, what was the annual? It was a monthly visit. And as we went into the doctor, he did the series of x-rays. And this time when he came back in a very stern voice, he looked at us and he said, how long has he been in the leg braces? It was really not a very intelligent question because the stack of x-rays were sitting right there. They had dates all on them. He knew how long. He knew just two weeks before, a month before that, there had been no change. He knew one month before. He looked at us and said, I don't understand, but this boy is healed and doesn't need to wear these leg braces anymore. <laughs> Praise God. And that's why I want to tell you today on the Sunday after Christmas that Jesus can do anything. He can do anything. He can do anything. Your minister of music is here because God would reach down and heal him as a three-year-old boy. And by the way, the, the pediatrician said he was going to have to have two operations and be in the leg braces for two years. That did not happen because the healing power of Jesus was present. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I want you to look at me, and you've been so attentive, and you've been so kind. I didn't come here just to dedicate a grandson. Oh, that was big. 
I came here with a word for you on Sunday. I've not come with my best sermon. I've come with you with a word on Sunday for you. You're here right now, and you need a miracle. You need a miracle desperately. If that's you, without us having to pray and go through all the little Christian calisthenics, I want you to stand right now where you are. You need a miracle. Stand. Yes, 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 yes. There's more. This is already an outrageous group that's standing, but there's more. Just listen to the Holy Spirit within you right now. Just let God give the altar call. I feel God's presence up here so real, I can hardly handle it. And I'm not making that up. God wants to do something for you right now. Anybody else, you said, I prayed for my son and he's not saved and I've had it with it. It's time for a miracle in our family. It's time for us to get this thing over. We, we're out of time. But the only way I know to do it is I want those of you that know how to pray, I want you to go to those standing right now and lay hands on them in the name of Jesus right now. Come on, come on, go, 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 go. Get up, the rest of you go and just, just go to them. Lay hands on them in the name of Jesus. I need some music somewhere, Chad. I want you to open your mouth right now and begin to pray a prayer of faith over somebody right now. Lord, I know what your word says. Your word says I am healed by the power of Jesus Christ. Your word says I am healed by the power of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth right now and say that's what the word says. That word has strengthened my expectation and my expectation has made me stand and act on your word and right now I receive my miracle in the name of Jesus now folks I'm not into calisthenics but those of you that have stood I want you to lift both hands in the air as a sign of receiving and say Lord I receive right now lay hands on these people and I want you to pray the prayer of faith come on open your mouth and pray Lord Jesus come right now Lord Jesus, come right now. 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 In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Come right now, Lord Jesus. Come right now, Lord Jesus. I want everybody to stand and lift your hands to the Lord and begin to thank God for what he has done in this place. Come on, lift your hands in the air and begin to thank God. That means surrender. Let me surrender. Begin to thank him right now. Lord Jesus, I give you praise. Lord Jesus, I give you worship. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Pastor Tom, come on.